Thank you for coming. Um, I know it's early morning, and I know it's hard to get to. So, uh, yeah. so we are very, we are very thankful that 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 you're here. It's it's nice for us to see all you students. We count on you for the next generation of Google, just in case that you were wondering. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> um, so let me ask you a question, Corinna. Uh, you got your computer uh, science degree, PhD, in 1993 at University of Rochester. You've worked at Bell Labs for another 10 years after that. And then that was before you joined Google Research in 2003. Uh, so you've seen the most critical periods of the evolution of machine learning. Uh, today, your team is at the heart of uh, both machine learning research and developing the next generation of breakthroughs and advancing our core product lines. So can you talk a little bit about how the technology has gotten to here and what you see as the actual next big challenge for machine learning? Sure. Um, so I started in machine learning probably in um, mid-70s or something like that, <laughs> before many of you might have been born. Uh, back then, it was Hopfield networks and Boltzmann machines, Kohonen self-organizing maps and perception algorithms. Our most sophisticated optimization algorithms were like simulated annealing and genetic algorithms. Um, later came back propagation and, and what was called the multilayer perception, uh, perception, perception algorithms. And um, there was a lot of hype and enthusiasm about this new area of, of uh, learning. We had people, I was in physics back then, from physics, from mathematics, from, um, from, from uh, any kind of neuroscience. Uh, they all gathered towards this, this new area. Um, the algorithms were fragile back then. Um, the, the results we saw with multilayer perceptron algorithms, they were not easily reproducible. And the, there were new algorithms coming all the time, so it wasn't hard to understand that those deep learning network algorithms from back then, they actually got pushed out a little bit. Uh, together with Vladimir Vapnik, I did support vector machines that were very popular for some years. And then, of course, the whole deep learning uh, wave came in. So I've seen it sort of go deep learning, not deep learning, deep learning. And I kind of Im Im imagine that we could be heading towards a non-deep learning uh, phase in the future. I don't know. I don't know. But it's just that what I've seen historically um, definitely is Amazing the results that we have seen with deep learning. I had never imagined that we would get to anything like that, simply putting in data, having a good architecture, and optimizing it without building in all kinds of constraints. So it's, it's super amazing, but it's also um, very draining on our computers. So I really hope that most of you will start thinking about some smaller models that can do just as amazing things as the big models that we see today, because efficiency is is a, a tough one right now. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there's been a lot of attention attracted to the large language models, and it's at the center of a lot of our projects at Google um, and Google Research. But they are quite heavy, as you uh, just mentioned. And since you are at the heart of um, this kind of rich universe of diverse computational research, can you talk a little bit more about kind of what are the other areas that are important for us to reach our technological potential? Well, um, if, we, if we stick a little bit to the large language models, um, then first and foremost, we have to work on efficiency. As students, you probably experience a lot of the same things. If you have to train these models, it's hard enough for you to get quotas. We also have to serve them afterwards. You don't have you just have to run it on the test set, get some good results, and, and write your paper, right? We actually have to put them into production. So we have a lot of work going on, and that's also good work for, for, for student researchers in anything efficiency when it comes to hardware, systems in general, and then of course. ML efficiency. So please, anything that you can do in that area and develop the next generations of small models. But going further down the path, um, we, have, we have areas that have seen a rejuvenation based on this LLM, 
whole uh, new, new generative AI. We have always had a fact-checking team at Google. Uh, even before the 2016 election, we had fact-checking in place. But of course, with the 2024 election coming up, we're going to need it a lot more. Uh, generative AI poses completely new challenges. It's not just text, it's images. We already saw in the previous election how, how videos can be compressed or stretched to make people look differently. It's our job in, in trust and safety to make sure that we are filtering out that we are catching uh, repeat offenders and harmful material as, as quickly as possible. Lots of work in graph algorithms because that's actually where we see the biggest gains uh, for that kind of application domain. Of course, there are also other downstream applications. Metcom was featured in the video you just saw. You can take, a, for instance, a photo of a skin thing and, and hopefully get some guidance to what, what it is that, that is happening, um, assistant technologies in general. And then, then of course, it's your data in, it's your data out of these uh, large language models. So privacy is a, is a huge thing, but that's kind of a topic on its own. Right, it is absolutely a topic. Um, I've seen that every time we're able to have a breakthrough in ensuring privacy in the technological space, we see a, a leap ahead in terms of what we're able to do for consumers, users, in terms of the um, personalization that we're able to do for them, and also the adaptability of the tools that we're able to provide for them. So um, where do you see privacy research at today, and what do you think we should be focusing on next there? Privacy is a very interesting trade-off between personalization. And on the one hand, we want Google to give results that are personalized for us. At the other hand, we, of course, don't want our, our search to follow us on the web uh, the next to two months when we were looking for a swimsuit, and now we keep getting this swimsuit. I mean, I bought one already three <laughs> months ago, so can't we stop this one? Um, so <laughs> um, users are reasonably enough uh, asking for much more privacy, especially control around privacy. When the first version of Google was built, this was actually not something that we thought much about because it wasn't, it wasn't a big thing. We've always been incredibly respectful of, of people's data. I must say that I, the two companies I worked at, there's been a, the other was the telephone company. <laughs> there, 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 there's been a very big difference. I, I've been always very surprised and happily surprised how protective we are of our data and, and making sure that, that access control is well installed. But there are so many privacy challenges. When we think about building the next generation of Google, with a privacy-first narrative. Uh, we have been working on uh, recently the third-party cookie deprecation. Hopefully the, the swimsuit and your suitcase and whatever you were shopping for will not follow you yep. um, soon. Uh, the the third-party cookies are these little cookies that, that make it possible. There's a link decoration. But these are kind of in the reactive mode. How do we actually create a Google that is built on privacy? We have surprisingly few tools still dear students and faculty. Differential privacy is the golden standard, um, but it's a very blunt hammer, uh, long tail distributions. We tend to lose all the information before we've added enough data. So we get to more common tools like K near, uh, uh, or uh, K apart, uh, anonymity. K, K anonymity, yeah. Um, and those, those can unfortunately be broken in so many ways. We have plenty of examples of that. We talk about re-identification risks, and we try to put measures around it. Um, we try to, but they're data distribution dependent, so, so we have to demonstrate with these distributions. It looks as if we are catching most of it, and you cannot be re-identified. But we need a whole new set of tools. They're trusted compute environments that we are developing, where you have federated input, and we have maybe a trusted, secure enclave they are executing on the computations and sharing out a private version. All these frameworks, I've 
things. We haven't developed it fully, and there's so much work that can be done and should be done so everybody can build a private new world, not just Google. We are happy to share everything that we do um, in open source code. We, that's actually a very important step of it. We shouldn't be private about what we do for privacy. That's the worst. We need to get the narrative out. We need to get consent from everybody out there that these tools are sufficient. So we share as much as we can. Uh, privacy Sandbox is one example of it, where we get together with other uh, consortiums and we, we share and we discuss whether this is good techniques for it going forward. We need it badly, so please uh, please uh, start doing, doing research in this area. <laughs> I think they heard you on that one. I, I definitely reach out afterwards for this. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about the uh, perspective you have. Uh, I've, I've seen that you bring quite unique perspective to work. Um, you're one of the few women in your field in the 90s. Um, you've experienced many different cultures from being in New York, Denmark, growing up in Denmark, and then now you live here in New York City. Uh, you've worked at two, what I consider groundbreaking companies through periods of immense innovation. So um, if you look back, and what, what do you see, feel that you've gained from these experiences, and how does that impact your work? I'm first and foremost Danish. I think that's um, no doubt about it. It's a very democratic country. We probably have 15 and so so parties in the in our uh, equivalent to to Congress uh, because every voice is important and everybody has a unique voice so nobody can fit into the same party. Um, every voice is important and everybody has the obligation to make their voice being heard also. That's kind of a societal responsibility. The voter participation is down now to 84%. That's the lowest it's been in 30 years. Something obviously happened after I moved away. Mm. But I, <laughs> I, uh, I kind of expect everybody to make their voice heard. And in Denmark, we also, um, the, the Nordic word of ombudsman goes back to Danish law in 1240 or something like that. There's always been a mechanism for making your voice heard. And I think that's something that I always try to bring to the organization organizations that I work in, that we need to have all perspectives, also intellectual perspectives, brought forward so we have a wealth of different ideas coming forward. My background with Bell Labs and now Google Research has uh, taught me technical excellence has to be at the forefront. Otherwise, we can way too easily be outrun. And how do you otherwise convince your boss that your solution is better than the one that they could develop over in the neighboring uh, uh, booth? So you always have to have um, guarantees, having been to able to prove that this is actually good work that you're doing. Um, Often we get inspirational for, from experiments, then, but then it's back, good to go back to the drawing board and really try to figure out why is it it works. So technical excellency, innovation are so important. But what we do should not be disconnected from real problems. That was one of the failures of Bell Labs, right? There were the business units and then there was the research uh, ivory tower. So when I got to Google Research, or actually when I started Google Research here in New York, it was always with the motto that whatever you work on should be relevant to Google. And the problem space, especially today, is so huge that it shouldn't be hard to find an interesting problem. You can be in market algorithms, you can be in, in robotics, you can be in uh, privacy, fairness, bias, all these areas. There's so many important problems. Speech recognition uh, came as a geo. Uh, there's so, so many problem spaces. So it shouldn't be hard for you to find a relevant area for your interests, but please always be able to tell me that. But then do it well. Do it well and go out to conferences uh, with your papers, write it up as open source libraries that we can put out there, put it into standards, work with the community and getting it out there. Um, so those are some of my reflections on. It, it resonates for me as well. I mean, I think that there is uh, uh, something unique about the fact that we both get to do research and apply it in such a tight loop. And this is something that I think has attracted many good, brilliant talent to Google and Google Research in terms of being able to actually see your research have real-world impact, so. Um, yeah, we work very, very closely with, with the, the 
PAs, product areas, as yes, we call PAs. them. So sometimes, you know, your beautiful paper, that's actually not what ends up being implemented. You have to do some modifications, right? Because real life systems are a little bit harsher, maybe, or, you know, latency and all these things. But um, um, maybe it's just one last question for me, and then uh, I don't know if we have, we'll have to let you run, I think, um, which is that, uh, you know, what do you see as a part of the research organization's um, values that are making it a success? So you talked a little bit about how it was important for um, Bell Labs potentially to have really been closer to the actual product or the actual um, solution space or uh, problem space that they needed to go after. Um, is there anything else in terms of just the organization in terms of how they should be thinking about you know, encouraging the um, the kind of talent that is, is attracted to research? I think it's very important that we remember in Google Research that we are hired to be researchers. Um, we, have a, we, we have a lot of very, very talented PhDs also in the product areas, and we work very closely with them. If we have the desire to really go and launch on a regular schedule, we have all the opportunities to do that. But it's very, very important that we remember we are researchers first, and it is our responsibility to have the technologies, the methodologies ready for the Google that is to come five years from now. Yeah. If we don't do that, Google has nothing in the pocket for the challenges that are to come. So we have to remember to step back, abstract the problems that we see, think about is this really the best solution could we scrap it all and start all over? Having the freedom, the mentality that it's okay and we can still be successful, that's what we really should be driving and is driving Google research today and hopefully for many years to come. Mm -hmm.